Good morning and welcome to the last video in this series of tutorials on SimTalk. In this video, we will finish our review of the main programming concepts by talking about how we can parameterize our methods and what advantage we have by doing so. To do this, we are going to view the methods from the outside without entering the code. Let's imagine that methods are black boxes that we ask to do certain tasks. For example, we can ask them to create parts for us, move them to another location, or load a transport. However, these are all simple tasks. If we want to go one step further and create methods capable of doing more complex tasks, we will most likely need to pass information to our method, receive feedback, and make decisions based on its value. This is what we call the parameterization of a method, that is, defining inputs and outputs of information. Continuing with the same example, let's imagine that in each of these processes, we want to do a check to see if the attributes of a part match a series of specifications. This check is always the same, but the part we are analyzing will change. We could include this check in each of the methods we already have, which would not be very efficient, or we can create a new method, pass the path of the part to analyze, and have it return whether it is correct or not. In this way, we manage to optimize our code much better and modularize a function that we would otherwise have repeated several times. With the concept explained, let's see how we can parameterize our methods. Let's start with the inputs. In SimTalk, we can define as many inputs as we want to a method, and to do so, we only have to start the method with the word param, and then list the inputs we need, specifying their type. For example, let's imagine that we want to make a method to which we pass two numbers, calculates the average, and prints it through the console. In that case, the code would be something like this. If we debug the method with F11, we will see that the inputs have been created for us in the variable tab, along with the average variable. And in fact, we can work with them as if they were two normal local variables. Now let's instantiate another method and call it from there. Since we have defined inputs, now we cannot call the average method by simply typing its path. If we try it, we will get an execution error saying that the method expects two inputs and we have not passed any to it. We must pass the inputs in parentheses after writing the path, and they must respect the same order in which the average method expects them. If we now debug from this second method and do a step into to enter the average method, we can see how now the two inputs no longer start with the default value of zero, but with the values that we have passed to them. Thus, if we call the average method with different combinations of inputs, each time it will print a different result through the console. On the other hand, we can also define outputs, although unlike inputs, SimTalk only allows us to define one output per method. Let's instantiate another method that we're going to call count elements. And we are going to program it to return how many objects there are in the frame at each moment. To declare an output, we must begin the code with a hyphen and the greater than sign, forming an arrow, followed by the format of the output, which in our case is integer. Next, we write the code to calculate the number of objects in the frame. With the self keyword, we can refer to the method itself. The location attribute of the method refers to the frame or folder where it is located, and the num nodes attribute of the frame refers to the number of elements it contains. Once we have the result we want, to return it as output, we have two options. The first is to use a return. We save the changes, clean the console, and we are going to call it from our secondary method as follows. We do the same exercise as before, debug the method, and with step into, we are going to enter the counting elements method. We calculate the number of nodes, which are four, the three methods and the event controller, and do the return. Since this result has been returned to the first method, we have printed it in the console with the print function. Another way to look at it is to make the call in the expressions tab and see that it is equivalent to writing a four. However, the return has a double function. It also automatically terminates the method. For example, if after the return we make another print, and we debug our secondary method again, we will see that that line is never executed. In fact, the return by itself can also be used in methods without output, and everything after it will not be executed. For example, if we use it in the secondary method after the first call, it will not execute the rest of the calls. The second way to return outputs is the result function. 
This works as if it were just another local variable. We can edit its value during the method as many times as we want, and the value at the end of the execution will be the one to be returned. We are going to modify the count elements method to use the result function and debug it to see the difference. As we see, as soon as we start the method, the result appears as another local variable. So we do as many calculations with it as we want. And when we finish, this value that it has will be the one that is returned upstream. However, in the same method, we can define inputs and outputs at the same time. The only restriction is that the inputs must always be defined before the output. For example, we are going to make our average method return the result instead of printing it to the console. If we execute the code of the secondary method, we will see how it now returns the result, and we can later do whatever we want with it. To finish, let's imagine that we want to use the inputs to be able to choose whether the average is done using absolute values or not. One way would be the following. We use an if-else structure and the ABS function, which calculates the absolute value of any number. When adding an input, we must also modify the method call. Let's remember that the inputs must be passed in the same order and respecting the same types that we have defined in the method we want to call. If we execute, we will see how the result varies depending on whether or not we activate the absolute input. But it could happen that in the vast majority of cases, we want to make a normal average without an absolute value and we do not want to have to write a false input every time since it is repetitive. For that, in the average method, we can assign a default value to the input as follows. Since this input already has a value, we can skip it in the call if we want. As we see, we continue to obtain the same results as before, even though in the first case we have not specified any true or false value. The only restriction to using this functionality is that all predefined inputs must be declared at the end. That is, we cannot alternate inputs with a predefined value and normal inputs. And here ends the last tutorial of the SimTalk programming course. Of course, the tool offers many more possibilities than we have covered in this video series. But I hope it has helped you understand how this programming language works, take your first steps, and start adding much more value to your simulation models. Without more, I say goodbye, greetings, and see you soon.